So good morning and, or good afternoon to everyone and thank you for joining us. Before we jump into the presentation, you will receive a copy of the presentation slides and this webinar is being recorded and will be available on telemetry.com after today. Please note on your attendee panel that there is a question box if you have any questions during the presentation and we'll answer as many as we can at the end of the presentation. My name is Carrie Fuqua and I'm the Director of Marketing here at Telemetry and I'd like to take a moment to introduce today's speaker, Madeline Lorano. Madeline's primary focus over the last 12 years has been on the talent management market, specializing in talent acquisition. Her work helps companies both validate and reevaluate their strategies and understand the role that technology can play in driving business outcomes. She has watched HCM transform from a back office function to a strategic company initiative with a focus on partnerships, experience, and efficiency. Before Aptitude Research Partners, Madeline held research roles at Aberdeen, Burson by Deloitte, ERE Media, and the Brandon Hall Group. She is the co-author of Best Practices in Leading the Global Workforce and has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal, the Boston Globe, Yahoo News, and the Financial Times. She is a frequent presenter at industry conferences, including HR Tech, SHRM, IRAM, HCI Strategic Talent Acquisition Conference, GDS International's HCM Summit, and HRO Today. In today's webinar, we'll be just discussing how the talent acquisition technology market moves quickly and, and how it's really hard to keep up with. The only thing that seems certain is that there are many unknowns. The past year has been characterized by new trends, new providers, and new investments. While it's an exciting time to be in talent, talent acquisition, it's also hard to make sense of all this change and at the same time keep looking into the future. Companies are thinking a lot about the future and what 28 will bring. As companies make more strategic decisions around their technology, we want to highlight what some of those trends will be in 2018. Some of the questions we'll be talking about today during the webinar are how important will AI become in the future of talent acquisition? What are some of the top areas of investment in talent acquisition technology? What solutions will drive the most value to help transform talent acquisition? And can we expect any consolidation over the next year? So with that, Madeline, I'd love to hand it over to you. Thanks so much, Carrie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. And a big thank you to Telemetry for inviting me to participate. I'm thrilled to be here talking about one of my favorite topics, which is talent acquisition trends. It's been a very exciting year in the talent acquisition technology market. It's a market that moves very quickly, and it's very, very hard to keep up with. Even for someone like me, whose full-time job is really to study and cover this market. We're seeing a lot of change. We're seeing new trends, we're seeing new providers, and we're seeing a lot of new investment in talent acquisition. And it's becoming a different conversation within organizations. So we've been thinking a lot about 2018. Can't believe we're, we're already in 2018. And we're gonna spend a little bit of time talking about some of the trends that we're seeing in the conversations we're having with companies and the research that we're conducting. So I know Carrie did an intro, I don't need to to give you any more or bore you any more with any introduction, but the reason I wanted to share this is to give you some insight into some of the research I'm gonna be sharing today. We're a research firm and we focus on HCM, and the research I'm gonna be sharing today is a combination of the quantitative research we do, which is through our surveys. Um, and we do three to four surveys every year, surveying buyers in, in talent acquisition and HR. And then we do a lot of interviews. We do a lot of qualitative interviews with companies to understand exactly what their pain points are and what strategies and technology they plan to use in the next year. So that's a little bit of what um, I'll be sharing today in the methodology. So what are we going to cover today? So I'm gonna keep it simple and really focus on three things. I'm gonna focus on the current state of talent acquisition technology, where organizations are investing, what buyers see as providing true value in this market, what's changed in terms of the buyer. We're gonna talk about key trends in the market. We're gonna look at what's driving a lot of the decisions in technology today. And then we're gonna talk about the future. What are the trends that you can think about and what are the trends you can ignore? 
And really what I want to leave you with as a key message is, and it comes up over and over again, especially in the interviews we do, is what's worked in the past will not work in the future. Companies really need to rethink their strategies, rethink their technology, and we know that value comes from change. Sometimes it's hard just to make those uh, changes realistic within the organization. So we're going to talk about how to, how to really drive change. So let's look at the current state of technology. And the first major shift, and for all of you very involved in talent acquisition, this should not be a surprise, the major shift that we're seeing is that talent acquisition is a business priority. And we hear this a lot and we know it's important, but I want to reiterate this and I really want to back it up with some research because talent acquisition is no longer a back office function. It's no longer siloed within an organization. When CEOs are interviewed, talent acquisition is their number one priority. This is research that was done by LinkedIn last year. And what they found is, again, there's a shift in how talent acquisition is being valued within an organization. 80 3% of companies say talent is their number one priority within the organization. 83% of companies say HR meets with the C-suite regularly. The CEOs within organizations are listening. They're listening to talent acquisition. They're listening to HR. They want to make better decisions about who they're hiring within the organization. And 70% of companies say that talent acquisition is critical to their business planning. Talent acquisition is a business priority. Research that was done by PwC in 2016 further emphasized this. They found that when they surveyed CEOs, and this is just research being done on CEOs, not on HR, they found that 77% of CEOs said the number one threat they face, the number one threat they face is the availability of talent. The number one threat that CEOs face is talent acquisition. That's what they're concerned is finding talent. And when they surveyed those companies again, the same CEOs, they found that 60% of those CEOs were rethinking their technology in this space, rethinking their strategies and rethinking their technology. So again, what worked in the past will not work in the future. So there's been a shift in how talent acquisition is being viewed within the business. Uh, many of you know this already within your own organizations. But the next shift I want to talk about is a new framework. For many of you that have been in this space for a long time, you probably remember when all we could talk about, especially as analysts, was integrated talent management. How could we think about one view for the employee, one experience where recruitment was a little bitty part of that? Um, today, it's really becoming very clear that talent acquisition deserves its own suite, it deserves its own conversation, and it deserves its own framework. It's that complex. It cannot be just lumped into integrated talent management. It really deserves a broader conversation. And what we're seeing companies think about when they think about this new framework is three main buckets. And we call this the trifecta. It's the attract phase. How do we think about our employer brand? How do we think about everything that happens before somebody actually applies for a job? How do we engage them? How do we nurture that talent? How do we provide the right communication? How do we make sure our sourcing is the right strategy? everything that happens before somebody applies for a job in that attract bucket. Then there's the recruit bucket that's typically managed by an ATS, where you think about how do you assess someone, how do you move them through the process. And finally, onboarding. Once somebody has accepted an offer, how do you make sure that you have the right forms, you're staying compliant, they have their computer on the first day, how do you make sure that everything's in place and they're actually being socialized into the company culture? This is the trifecta. And within each of these buckets, it becomes very complex when you think about the different strategies and the different technology. But the thing I want to point out with this slide and the research that we've done on this trifecta is that where companies are spending most of their investment is in this attract phase. One in three companies are increasing their investment in attract. And a lot of that investment is coming into recruitment marketing platforms. There's tremendous value for companies in thinking about one solution to be able to manage everything that happens pre-applicant. And for a lot of companies, it's not necessarily finding new budget to invest in a recruitment marketing platform. It's just rethinking how they budgeted in the past. It's rethinking what the spend goes into agencies, what spend you're investing in job boards, what spend you're investing in um, advertising or third-party recruiters. And how can we take that spend and get more value from it from 
one system, one platform in recruitment marketing. And this has been a big trend. To be honest, it's one of the questions we get asked most often from companies that we interview and talk to. So it's becoming a business priority. We know that there's a new framework for talent acquisition, which means it deserves its own conversation. And the other big shift that I want to point out is that there's new investment in talent acquisition. And I think a lot of companies realize this, but a lot of companies really had a lot of um, aha moments in the past few years when they realized how much they were spending on talent acquisition and how much they were planning to increase their investment because they really understand that it is a business priority. I mentioned that LinkedIn study um, that they did last year. They also, within that study, asked companies around the globe um, if they were increasing their spend in talent acquisition. And in every region that they looked at, in North America and Europe and Asia, um, every company was increasing their spend in, in talent acquisition. And again, I think that emphasizes this is a global trend, that this is a business priority. When we ask companies what the three major investments will be in 2017, um, and it's becoming very clear it's true for 2018 as well, it's three main areas. Applicant sourcing, which falls under that recruitment marketing bucket in the, um, in the attract phase of the trifecta, free hire assessment, and background screening. So the interesting thing about this is that these are not necessarily new areas. These are areas that have been part of town acquisition for a long time, especially if you think about background screening and assessments. Companies have used these for a long time and, and have had providers in place for a long time. What's changed is that companies really realize that as they're looking to be more strategic in talent acquisition, as they need help really finding quality of hire, they need solutions that will offer less bias and more science. And there's a lot of discussion in the space about what's new, how can we invest in something new, 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 new. And I think it's very telling that what companies really are looking for is almost back to the basics. We want to think more strategically about the way that we source for talent, the way that we assess talent, and the way that we screen talent. The new investment, and there's also a lot of new challenges, which makes this job of being a talent acquisition professional very exciting and at the same time um, can be a little bit difficult. So the major challenges that companies are facing are this need to align with business and pressures. So again, as the business becomes more involved, as you see the research from PwC, where CEOs are saying this is their number one threat, their number one priority, they need to rethink their, their talent and strategies and technology. What does this mean for the talent acquisition professional? What does this mean for the technology you're using? And it means that you're being held more accountable to business outcomes. You need to measure business results. You need to think about the metrics you have in place and make sure that those are metrics that the business is actually tracking as well, that metrics that the business actually cares about. Um, talent acquisition is being held accountable. And that means that you need technology that's going to let you be accountable. And it means that you need the right strategies in place. So companies are really rethinking the technology they use and make sure that they're not only talent acquisition technology, but business solutions as well. The next major challenge is thinking about the gig economy. For so long, companies have had procurement responsible for the contingent workforce and have had um, HR and talent acquisition responsible for full-time employees. And now we're starting to think more about total talent acquisition. How can we think about making sure that we have insight into all of our workforce, including contingent? And contingent workforce is not just temporary workers or how we think about them traditionally. It's thinking about I, you know, independent contractors, highly skilled workers, SOW-based projects, every generation, is really thinking about the benefits of a flexible workforce, and companies have to be able to adapt to that. And we need technology that can adapt to that as well. We found, just to give you a little data point here, we found that 70% of companies are investing in contingent workers 2017, um, and we expect that number to continue to, to increase. New technology, we're seeing a lot of new solutions in the market, and while that is very exciting, and creates a lot of new opportunities and can make your job fun when you're looking at all this technology, the challenge that it presents is how do you know what exactly you need? What does the talent acquisition technology stack look like for your organization? 
How can you make sure that these solutions can meet your unique needs? And the challenge with a lot of the new technology providers is, are these providers that have staying power in this market? Are they providers that are going to be sticking around? Or are they looking to get acquired? Are they going to go out of business? The challenge with new technology is, while it presents a lot of opportunity to rethink a lot of these strategies, you have to make sure that the provider you're investing in does have that staying power. Just to give you a little bit of, of research here, CB Insights is a company that does market research on lots of different areas within the business of technology. And what they found for HR technology is that the investment, and this is investors putting money into this, this technology space, were investing $400 million in 2012. And by the end of last year, they were over $2 billion of investment. So that's how much it skyrocketed. That means there's a lot of new technology providers out there in this industry, and there's a lot of new solutions to, to really consider. Um, transparency. I think it goes without saying today's candidates expect a lot of transparency from their employers, and employers expect more from the candidates as well. Social media is driving a lot of change. So how can we think about the role transparency plays when we're thinking about technology and when we're thinking about how we're going to be engaging with candidates and communicating with candidates in the next year? Oh, let's get to slide there. So new priorities, speaking of the candidate, what we found as the top priority for last year and 2016 is improving the candidate experience. And we just got our research back, uh, a survey that we just conducted a few weeks ago, said that this is also true for 2018 as well. And I can tell you, I've asked this question in every survey I've done for 14, 15 years, and this is the first time it's been number one. This is not something you would have seen on a top 10 list for priorities five, six, seven years ago. This is a new priority for organizations. It's thinking about how can we improve the candidate experience? How can we think about doing a better job of communicating with, with our candidates? And the reality is companies understand, I just had a conversation with a large financial services firm um, this morning, and, and what they said is that they understand they need to be selling jobs at every stage of the talent acquisition process, engaging with candidates in a very, very different way. And they understand the value of doing that, but it's hard at times to be able to think about making those changes. And when we ask companies, only 40% of companies have actually improved the candidate experience. So if you think about how much of a priority it is for organizations, how much we talk about it within the technology that we use, why are we not seeing a more significant improvement in how we engage with candidates? And we're gonna talk about some of the trends there and some strategies. Another shift in the market and a, certainly a challenge that some companies face is that over 30% of companies are investing in an HRIS provider for their recruitment technology. Um, and this is a, a great benefit for IT, certainly, to think about um, having that integration and making sure that the solutions they're using are, are integrated with their broader ERP and talent management and HCM strategy. The challenge it can place on organizations and talent acquisition departments is that often it doesn't provide the deep functionality and the expertise in talent acquisition to be able to meet your needs. So if you think about how complex talent acquisition has become, how much pressure you're getting to actually become and be able to solve this business challenge, is the HRIS provider the, the provider that can be able to solve that challenge? And it really comes down to being able to make sure that the technology you have in place that integrates with that HRIS can support that, whether it's from a recruitment marketing provider, whether you're using video interviewing, um, whether you're using online reference calls or some of these chat and communication tools with candidates, how can you make sure you have the right technology to be able to provide that expertise, to be able to provide a better experience for your candidates when your HRIS might not be able to do that? So as all this change is happening and talent acquisition is really forming its own suite here of solutions, what we're seeing is that how companies buy talent acquisition technology has really changed. And it's less becoming less dependent on the RFP, which for so long was the holy grail of making a selection in, in this technology. And it's becoming more of thinking about how um, to really find that true partnership. 
So less than 50% of companies say that the RFP has in influence over their decision making. And one additional data point I'll, I'll throw in here, and we just got this research back, is that 53% of companies say that um, they have replaced some type of their talent acquisition technology in 2017. They've replaced some area of talent acquisition technology. And 47% of companies plan to replace more of that technology in the next year, 2018. So what does that mean? And to me, that really means that companies want a partner. They don't want a technology provider who's going to provide them a solution and then run away, or who's gonna sell them a solution that they don't know how to use. They really need to have a partner. This is true of companies of all different sizes. We, we, we really learn this when we do the interviews, is that the partnership with your technology provider is the most important thing. And when companies make that selection, they are relying on word of mouth and they're relying on reference calls to find out what providers really can provide that partnership. What providers can help them scale, can provide the security they need, can help them adapt as, as they continue to change and evolve. So that's the market that we're facing in talent acquisition. It's, as I said, a very exciting area to be in. Your, your job as talent acquisition professionals are incredibly complex and incredibly exciting and, and seem to be changing all the time. So um, I recognize it's, it's not always easy, but I think if we can think about what are some of the, the trends that are shaping a lot of the decisions companies are making, we can understand what's important and often what we need to think about as organizations. And I think to me what really resonated in the past year is that sometimes we focus, and we do this as analysts, so much on what's new, what's next, that we tend to lose sight of what provides value. And that's what I really want to talk about for our remaining time here today is what is providing value for your organization as you face this complexity, as you drive a better candidate experience uh, to who you're reaching and who you're communicating with. And in some cases, it means just getting back to the basics. How can we do a better job to be able to really get back to the basics and understand what we need to do um, to make talent acquisition more strategic? So when we think about what's changed and some of the trends that we're going to talk about in a minute, to me, and this is a, this is a big takeaway that I, I hope you leave with from this presentation, is when we think about what makes technology great, and I spend a lot of time thinking about technology and, and, and really what provides value to organizations, to me, it really comes down to three things. And as you think about your conversations, as you think about doing your customer reference calls, I hope that this comes across in, in the information you're gathering. It's three things. It's the experience, not only the experience that's provided to your candidates and the user experience, and we all understand what feels good and what doesn't, and what looks good and what doesn't, but it's the experience you have with that provider. Are they treating you like a partner? Are they listening to the concerns that you have? The talent acquisition buyer is much more sophisticated than it was in the past, and you as a professional understand what you need and what's gonna drive change and what's your unique hiring needs more than a technology provider can in many cases. So does that provider provide you with that positive experience, not only in the technology, but also in a partnership? Do they have the expertise? Is this the provider that truly understands the market, understands what's happened in talent acquisition? So often what we're seeing in the space is because there's so much investment, because there's so much opportunity, it's a great, great market to be in, we're seeing providers come in it that have a lot of different backgrounds. And a lot of it's opportunistic. They, they recognize that this is the market that they could grow in. Maybe they could sell a company. Maybe they could sell two companies. So you really have to make sure that the provider that you invest in has expertise in this market. And the final trend is adoption. Making sure that this is technology that your recruiters are going to use, your managers are going to use, and your candidates are going to use. And they're going to want to use it. So often, and we did research on just the ATS market as one example, we found that only 3% of companies were using all of the functionality in their ATS. Very low adoption. How can we make sure that we're investing in solutions that really are solutions that will be used within an organization that can help drive that change? So let's think about this in the context of the trends we're about to talk about. What technology providers will actually provide this experience, will provide the expertise, and will provide the adoption? So the major trends we're going to talk about right now are 
greater simplicity and improved candidate communication, because when you think about the candidate experience, it really comes down to how are we communicating with our candidates? How are we providing what they need to know? In many cases, a candidate just wants to know if they're gonna receive um, any type of communication. How long does it take from the time that you actually are screening me till the time I would get the offer? How long would it take from the time I get an interview till I get called back? How long did it take from the time I submit my application until um, I might hear some type of communication? And so often companies just don't communicate anything with the candidate. And that's the most frustrating part. So how can we improve communication? An increased investment in recruitment marketing. We're seeing this across the board. I showed you this when we looked at the trifecta, at that attract bucket is becoming the primary area of investment for talent acquisition. And data to, to drive decisions. We talk a lot about data and analytics in talent acquisition. It's a topic that to me, it doesn't seem as scary as it used to seem in the past. And the point I want to make here is you're going to get a lot of data from all the different technology providers you use. You're going to get a lot of data from information you're collecting yourself. How can we use this data to drive decisions? We don't want to just gather data and transfer the data onto the business. We want to be able to use that data to make better decisions, to inform the business leaders that we, that we are communicating with, and to be able to really make change within the organization. And the final trend, and we talked a little bit about this with the gig economy, is the expanded definition of the candidate. So it's true when you think about the contingent workforce, but it's also true when you think about internal mobility, which is a big trend that we're seeing as well. So let's talk about simplicity. Talent acquisition is incredibly complex. I think I said this like 10 times already in just the past 30 minutes, but it's amazing how much this market has grown in complexity, especially with the technology providers in the space. When you look at only 3% of companies are using all of the capabilities in their ATS, 51% of companies are using three or more ATS systems. And this is true not just for ATS or sourcing, you can see 66% here. It's true for a lot of different areas of technology. I had a call with an assessment company using assessments um, last week, and, and they were using three different assessment providers, and they didn't even know they were using them. They had just different parts of the business that invested in them. How can we make sure that we are simplifying the way that we're using talent acquisition technology to get the most value from it? And the way that we try to simplify it, because it's a lot, and there's a lot of new categories. Everyone seems to announce a, a new category every week. Um, we think about it as really this landscape. It's a trifecta of a recruitment marketing platform, candidate engagement platform, whatever you want to call it something that actually manages everything pre-applicant. Your ATS system, which handles the workflow, make sure you stay compliant. The onboarding system, which handles everything for a new hire within your organization. That's the trifecta. And then there's an ecosystem of solutions that will integrate with those technologies. So that could be different sourcing solutions that you might be using, background screening providers that you might have in place, job distribution solutions, different types of employer branding solutions, um, video interviewing providers. And the ecosystem for companies is all going to vary. It's going to depend on what you have in place, what you see as providing value, what you've been able to, to gain buy-in for within your organization. But that trifecta for an organization really should stay the same. It's thinking about, do we have something in place to be able to handle what happens and how we engage with someone before they apply? Do we have an ATS to manage that workflow? And do we have a way to onboard someone and make sure that we stay compliant once they become a new hire? And when you think about the experience, when, when you think about this different technology, this is research that was done by the talent board. And what they found is that 70% of candidates are doing their own research on an employer before they apply for a job. 13% of candidates in that attract phase are applying through a mobile device, very low. I think we hear research, and this is research that is done from the candidate. This is asking candidates. Only 13% are applying. Um, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to just think about how can we do a better job of simplifying that experience for the candidate. For us as organizations, the technology has become overwhelming and complex. How can we make the, the candidate experience as simple as possible? How can we make sure that they understand what's happening at every stage through the process, that we're selling them on jobs at every stage through the process, 
that there actually is a process in place um, that starts even before they apply for a job. And the way that we found that companies can be very effective in doing that, simplifying the candidate experience, is through better communication. We spent a lot of time talking about communication last year. We actually called it the year of communication. And it's a very basic concept. It's a, it's a simple concept in, in any relationship that you have, even if it's employer or candidate. But it's one that gets overlooked so often. Um, just research that was done, this is Internet Live Stats, um, found that in just one second, these are the number of Skype calls, tweets that happen, Google searches, YouTube videos viewed, just in one second. And then if you look at how many emails are sent just in one second, it's pretty amazing, over 2 million. And what we found when we did our research is 47% of employees and candidates do not read an email. This is not an effective way of communication. Yet this is what we tend to rely on in talent acquisition, in HR, we rely on email. We send an email, we have our systems that basically will, will send out emails. And candidates aren't reading it. They're often missing the emails, it's not engaging, it's not meaningful, and it's not frequent. So email is not necessarily the right form of communication. So what is? Um, and what we found is that a lot of the technology that we're using, that's what, what they rely on. They provide just a way to basically engage through email. You can see only 39% of companies would recommend their current recruitment technology. One in four are not measuring the impact of communication and 46 are not even reaching their candidates with basic written communication. So what is an effective way of communication? This is research um, that was done by a company and what they found is that um, video has really um, increased in usage. So video took up approximately 57% of consumer internet traffic. By two, 2017, um, experts believed it would rise to 69% and then 79% this year. So video is obviously where a lot of people communicate, we rely on the whole next generation, I heard doesn't even use Facebook, which is pretty amazing to me. They, they primarily use YouTube and Snapchat and, and other ways of providing that video. So if video is where our candidates live, if video is a mode of communication that people are familiar with, why don't we use it enough in our talent acquisition strategies? Um, and it's not just video, it's thinking about how can we provide more meaningful conversations through um, different dialogues, whether that be chat, messaging, um, providing just the right content to candidates before they apply. And, and the point I want to make here with the communication is two things. One, it doesn't have to just be one thing. You don't have to put all your eggs in, in one bucket and say, we just want to rely on video solely to communicate with candidates. You can try multiple strategies. You can use video, you can use um, chat, you can try, try out what works. You should be communicating with candidates where they live. And if it's in text, if it's in chat, if it's in video, um, find out where, where they communicate and make sure you're part of that conversation. Ericsson is, is an example of a company and what they found is when they started to really invest more in employer branding, they started to get involved in conversations that were happening, even outside of the world of talent acquisition. They would use Twitter as, as one example of providing this communication, and they would get involved in dialogues on popular TV shows, and they would get involved in dialogues at the Super Bowl, and they would just go where the conversation was happening, where there was a conversation in place, where their candidates were likely to be having conversations they were going to be part of that conversation. So again, be part, of, be part of the conversation and use the right communication tools to be part of those conversations. And the second point I want to make with the candidate communication is um, you really need to make sure that it's three things. And I talk about being frequent, um, consistent, and, and meaningful. It needs to be able to provide some value to your candidate. If you're just sending out um, a standard template that's not personalized in any and in any way, um, it's not really providing value. You know, and when we talk about recruitment marketing, and a lot of companies are using this technology to be able to create custom messages for for candidates, whether it's thinking about improving your veteran hiring programs or your diversity and inclusion efforts. How can we think about again being where the conversation is taking place and providing meaningful dialogue to those conversations, engaging with candidates in a meaningful way?
So that's the communication piece. Now let's talk about data, which is at one time everyone's least favorite topic in talent acquisition, and now it's becoming one of the most popular topics when you think about how popular AI has become. And it's amazing to me, and we'll talk about AI in more depth in a minute, um, how many companies are thinking about AI, it's, it's hard to talk about talent acquisition technology without talking about it, yet how much confusion there still is around what AI is and, and what it's being used for. Um, and to me, where data can really drive value is providing that transparency of information, but being able to take action on that data. How can we know everything about how to engage with talent throughout the entire process? When you think about the attract phase, how can we make sure that the data that we're using um, and, and gathering helps us provide the right content, provides the right messaging, provides the right communication strategy? How can we actually make changes with the data that we're collecting? How can we make sure that when the person that is applying for a job is going through the whole ATS and, and the whole experience of, of, of being an applicant, that we're providing them um, with the information that they need, that we're able to gain insights about how candidates are um, engaging and moving forward and deciding not to apply and not to take a job. How can we make sure that we're getting the right data that we need to take action and make changes? Let's talk about AI. <laughs> um, it's just amazing to me how much of a priority this has been for organizations and how much dialogue there is around AI, yet how much confusion still exists. And it's confusing even for me as somebody that studies this space. Over 60% of companies that, that we surveyed are, are still confused by AI. And I was at a conference last year and a question came from the audience about AI and it was really around, is this going to be a robot that's going to come into our workforce and replace what we do in talent acquisition? And, and that's not the case. There's a lot of use cases for AI and there's a lot of use cases for machine learning um, that don't necessarily mean recruiters are losing their jobs, but it's a fear for a lot of organizations. To me, when I think about AI and the value it provides for an organization, the value really can come from providing the right data to be able to make those better decisions, what we just talked about. How can we think about providing the right information to be able to say, okay, this is the, the type of communication that our candidates like. How can we provide more of it? This is the right type of content that will attract talent that's more likely to um, apply for a job, that's more likely to accept an offer. How can we have the right data to be able to predict future performance? of the people that we're engaging with or the people that we're actually hiring. So how can we use AI to, to help make better decisions within our talent acquisition process? And the thing with AI and the thing that um, I hope comes across as clear from this presentation is there are a lot of providers out there that are saying they are AI solutions. There are a lot of startups that are coming into this market and saying we are the AI, AI fill in the blank of whatever technology you might be looking at. The challenge with this with AI is that you need to have a lot of data. You need to have a lot of trusted data to be a credible AI provider. If you are not, if you do not have access to a lot of data, you're not able to truly provide any value there um, to be able to create a system that actually learns and can provide you with with the right data to make the right decisions. Um, so, the the recommendation I have for you as you're looking at providers and you're considering AI and job matching is really to make sure that you're considering providers that have some staying power um, and have access to a lot of data, not just startups that are coming in and trying to, to jump on the AI bandwagon. So let's talk about the contingent workforce and how this area is, is certainly growing and we need to think about an expanded view of the candidate. When we ask companies their investment in the contingent workforce, you can see 70% of companies are hiring and engaging with contingent workers in some way. And again, this could be much more than temporary workers, independent contractors. This could be SOW-based projects. Companies see the value in a flexible workforce. Candidates see the value in being a flexible worker. And organizations need a better way to think about how can we manage, how can we engage with talent that is not only our full-time traditional workers, but also 
this whole gig economy, the, the contingent workers as well. So um, the, the challenge is that procurement for a long time has owned this contingent workforce management and talent acquisition has been responsible for more traditional workers, full-time employees. How can we think more holistically about total talent acquisition? How can we invest in providers that are thinking about contingent workforce and, and how to make um, you know, more insight and help us make a more cohesive strategy with our contingent workforce? And this is certainly a trend that we're gonna see in the future. And as we think about the expanded view of the candidate, internal mobility certainly plays a role. A lot of organizations are thinking more strategically around how can we not only send jobs out to external talent, but our internal talent as well. And for a long time, the ATS did very little for internal mobility. They did very little to be able to give organizations a way to send jobs out to internal talent first, to be able to really think about um, the value of having a strategy there. And um, when you think about every stage of the talent acquisition process, including what happens pre-applicant with the recruitment marketing, how can we think about providing that same type of experience and the same type of engagement to employees that might be interested in different opportunities? And the value is huge. The value is not only to a stronger talent acquisition process and you know, a better onboarding experience for somebody that already works at your company, but it's also a lot of value for retention. And we found that retention is the number one priority for organizations um, for 2018. They're thinking about how can we retain the talent? How can we think about retention when we're actually recruiting for talent? And um, certainly when you think about retaining talent, internal mobility, providing those opportunities play a major role. 53% of companies are investing in internal mobility. 70% of companies are increasing that investment. So I know we, we shared a lot here um, today, and I'm going to sum up with some of the recommendations. Um, but I'll start by saying what I said when we started the presentation. What's worked in the past for talent acquisition, this kind of siloed approach where we operated just in a very ad hoc way, is not going to work today. What's worked in the past is not going to work anymore. Companies really need to rethink the strategies and the technology that they're using. They need to find a better partner. And um, the other piece I'll say is, when you're thinking about that technology, you really want to make sure when you're looking at providers, they really hit all three of those categories. Providing a better experience for you as the customer, providing that expertise in talent acquisition, they understand the challenges you face and have developed a solution that will meet those challenges. And then making sure that you have a solution that is going to actually be used, not only by your candidates, but by your managers and your recruiters as well. So the key recommendations I have for you are Simplifying the process, it's become incredibly complex and we tend to make it more complex as we think about all of this what's new, what's ahead, um, you know, getting excited for next, next, next. But in many cases, we need to take a step back and just simplify the process. What are our priorities for our organization this year? What do we need to think about and how can we invest in solutions that are going to actually help us be effective in achieving those goals? Um, simplify the process, create a landscape. I created one and shared it with you that has a trifecta and then an ecosystem. What does yours look like? Draw it out, map it out, simplify the process as much as you can. And anyone that comes in and tries to complicate your own understanding of what your framework is um, and your priorities are, um, is not gonna provide you value. If you can simplify the process, that's where you're gonna see value. Embrace data, it's exciting. Data, we use it in our personal lives all the time. It's not we use it for anyone that has a Fitbit, anyone that um, you know, is an Amazon user. We know data. We, are, we should not be afraid of data. And for so long, um, talent acquisition had this reputation of being hesitant to, to think about data. Um, but we're familiar and, and we're ready to embrace data. So how can we think about using that data and taking action on it? And if you're collecting a lot of data and you have a lot of solutions giving you a lot of data, but you don't know how to make sense of it, it's not providing value. Make sure that, that the data that you have is data you're able to take action on. Then look at the consumer world when you think about the experience providing to your candidates, especially that communication we talked about. What resonates with you as a consumer when you think about um, this type of communication, when you think about how companies are communicating with you, the meaningful messages, the frequent messages, 
Are they using video? Are they communicating with you on social media? Are they communicating with you and offering you chat? And try to provide that same type of experience to the candidate. And so often I tell companies to, to just be a candidate for a day. Test it out. See what it's like. Apply for a job at your organization. See what that experience is like. Um, take it as far as you can take it and see what that experience is like. And then go to some of your competitor sites and apply for a job. See what that experience is like. Um, really become an expert on the experience. Become a champion of that experience and provide the right communication. Because to me, that's what it comes down to. It's really having that communication. And then empower your team to, to think more strategically. Um, we know that we have to make changes. We know there's value in change. But how can we actually start today to execute on a lot of the changes we want to make? And then invest in the right provider. And what I mean by that is really thinking about a partner. So often we get excited by technology. We think about um, what might be using or what providers we might be familiar with. But if that provider is not going to be a partner to you and is not going to hold your hand through some of the hard times, not just the good times, um, they might not be the right, the right fit for your organization. That partnership is becoming more and more important. And we're seeing a lot of companies really expecting services as well as technology from those providers. So that's, that's the end. That's um, our recommendations and some of the trends that, that we're certainly seeing in the next year. And I think we have a little bit of time left for some Q&A. Thanks, Madeline. That was a great presentation and great insights to uh, see how you see the recruiting industry evolve over the coming year. Um, one of the points that you made that I think is so relevant and just wanted to highlight it is all this new, new technology is great, but let's not just get caught up in what's new, but let's focus on what's providing value. And I think that's a great reminder for us all. Um, for reminder for everybody, if you do have any questions, please enter them into the questions box on your panel. Um, we do have a couple of questions, Madeline, who that have come in to ask of you. The first one was, how has the talent acquisition buyer changed to adapt to these trends? Yeah, that's a great question. And the buyer has changed a lot. Uh, the talent board has done research um, for the past few years, and what they found is that it's becoming much more sophisticated. They're doing their own research. They're researching organizations, and they understand their unique needs. So there's a couple different ways that I want to talk about how the buyers change. The first is to say that the buyer is much more sophisticated. Um, and the buyer should feel, and you should feel, as a talent acquisition professional, empowered that you know what your organization needs. You understand your challenges better than anybody else. So have confidence in that, and um, especially when you're engaging with a lot of the providers out there. Um, the other way that I'll say that it's, it's changed is it's become um, more complex <laughs> with how talent acquisition departments are structured. There isn't just talent acquisition and recruiters and that report to HR or business units. It's now a lot of specialists within a talent acquisition function. So depending on your organization, there might be social media specialists, there might be digital specialists, there might be um, data scientists with on your talent acquisition team, employer branding specialists. I talked to a company the other day that had just an assessment team within the talent acquisition function. So the talent acquisition function is, is more complex and you really have to think about all of this expertise on those teams and how to bring them into the buying process. Is it just gonna be talent acquisition that's gonna be involved or are you gonna leverage a lot of those specialists? And I didn't share some of this research today, but we, we found that specialists are being included more and more in that buying process. Great. The next question was, what do you think will be the greatest talent acquisition investments in the next year? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I think um, AI has been a big topic, but I think what we're going to continue to see is a lot of the same investments. When we get a lot of... Uh, questions around assessments. I see that as being a, a top priority for organizations. Um, certainly recruitment marketing has just been a trend that keeps going up and up. And I think organizations are smarter now about who they're investing in and what options they have. Um, and they're gonna need to continue to be smarter about um, how they continue to leverage these solutions. So recruitment marketing for sure. And then also predictive analytics. When you think about um, how companies are being able to use past data to be able to predict future performance. 
every interview we do with companies, um, this is a priority for them. So the more we can think about whether it's coming from our existing technology or um, other providers out there is, is going to continue to be a big investment. Um, and then the third question that we have is, uh, what is the future of artificial intelligence as it relates to recruiting? Yeah, I think the future is really going to be that we stop um, talking so much about it and it becomes either embedded in a lot of the technology we already use. Um, a lot of the ATS providers are talking about um, AI and how they can um, be more strategic with, um, uh, you know, including them in, in their solutions. And then I think um, we're gonna see a lot of these standalone AI startups either have an exit strategy, either get acquired or um, you know, move on because they can't sustain in this market. So I think we're gonna see some, a little more clarity here in the, in the AR market from the providers that really have some bank power and what the value will be. That's my hope anyway. Great. Well, that's all the questions that we have. Madeline, thank you so much for your insights and uh, sharing with our audience today. Thanks so much, Carrie. Thank you everyone for joining the call today. Great. Have a great day, everybody.